Amen. Uh, greetings, everyone. And let me just uh, pray as well. I ask you, Lord, to fill me with your spirit, and with your words as I open my mouth. Our desire tonight is that Jesus would be magnified, glorified, that our hearts would be drawn to him in greater measure. We ask you, Lord, to um, just bring honor to his name as we share together. We love you. We love one another. We Amen. love the work of yes, your spirit. Lord. We Lord, thank you, Lord, Lord Jesus, that you are building your church. Amen. And the gates of hell shall not, will not, and cannot prevail Praise against you, this. Amen. We bless you and commit this time to you. Holy Spirit, lead and speak to our hearts afresh tonight. And may we all have our hearts strangely warmed again. Amen. By the Spirit of God. Amen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me begin by doing what was done in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, where it says in Acts 21, verse 19, and when he had greeted them, and I too greet those present here in the room and greet those who are online uh, watching I greet you in Jesus' name. It's wonderful to be part of the family of God, isn't it? Yes. That we can travel anywhere in the world and find brothers and sisters in Christ, and we know immediately that we're with family. Yeah. It doesn't matter the nationality, the color, the tongue. We're of one spirit, and it's just a miracle. It's a wonderful thing, and it's great to, to be with you. Uh, here tonight in this place. I believe it's ordained of God that we should be together. And uh, as we are sharing, we're worshiping him. We're loving him. We're thanking him for all that he has done in each of our lives and is doing. So uh, the scripture says that when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And I just want to emphasize with great joy those words, what God had done <laughs> through his ministry. And we, we can speak of individuals, how, how God uses certain individuals, but it's God in that person. We're just earthen vessels, all of us. We're weak and we're dependent upon him to speak in and through us. Uh, I would suggest to you that um, anything that God has done through me and my ministry, particularly in Cameroon, uh, I'm just a turtle on a post. <laughs> a turtle on a post. There was a young boy that was going to school, lived in a rural area, and on his way to school, he saw a turtle on the ground. And he picked the turtle up, and he put the turtle on a fence post. And he went to school, and people came by that post, and look at that turtle on a post. How in the world did that turtle climb up that post? That's impossible. How did that turtle get there? And, of course, the answer is the turtle was put there. The turtle was placed there, and that's what God does with all of us, isn't it? We're, we're just turtles on a post. Whoops. Excuse me. This phone is going off, and... Uh, I'm going to put it on silent so it doesn't disturb us again. Forgive me. Uh, my Bluetooth was on. So um, I'm just a turtle on, on a post, and um, God is great. God is great in us. It's a wonderful thing to know that God is with us. And I set out uh, two weeks ago from Orlando, and I just want to share a before and after story prior to speaking about Cameroon. This may encourage you. I hope, I hope it will. But I'm the type of person that 
I believe Ephesians 2, verse 10, where it says, We are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has already ordained. He foreordained good works before the foundation of the world that we should walk in, right? Mm -hmm. So I am simple enough to believe that every day God has just got good works for me to walk in. Mm -hmm. And so I often pray, as I did even this morning, Lord, show me if you're working in somebody's life and where I can join in with you in that work. So when I set out for Orlando uh, two weeks ago, I had prayed that prayer. Is there someone that you want me to talk to, Lord? And I met the British Airways, uh, talking to the British Airways ticket agent, making conversation. I was inquiring about something regarding my ticket. And she was very, very helpful. And I said, thank you, Lucy. I said, may I ask you a question? And here's the question. I said to her, if there's one thing I could pray for you personally, what would it be? She almost started to cry. She said, I need a financial breakthrough. I need a financial breakthrough. And so I said, I am going to pray for you. And I told her that for the last nine years, every day I send out a Bible verse to more than 200 people around the world in four different languages. <laughs> yeah, it's I don't force anybody. I ask people if they'd like to have it. Um, you can have it. All you have to do is give me your mobile number, your email. Uh, uh, you, you'll get it by text or by email, whatever you choose. So now more than 200 people around the world get a Bible verse every day. Mm, and yeah. <laughs> I, I do not I don't make any comment. I believe in the power of God's word by itself. So I said, Lucy, I do this. Would you like to receive that? She says, oh, yes, I would. And conversation went on. Uh, do you think you could help me find a church? And it was a great conversation. It was a divine appointment. Heathrow, I landed there at five o'clock, three hours ago. Traffic was heavy for Vicky. I'm going to be at least a half hour late. No problem. I'll sit and have a coffee at the, the Costa shop. And not many tables or chairs available, but there's one man sitting at a table with four chairs, him by himself. I said, do you mind if I join you? And uh, he was a typical Yorkshireman, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we got chatting and uh, asked him all kinds of questions to, um, you know, just open up the conversation. And we got along quite well. And uh, I said, uh, Trevor, is there, can I ask you a question? I, he says, sure. I said, if there's one thing I could pray for you personally, what would it be? And he, he told me this, this rough and tough cursing Yorkshireman uh, told me he'd been searching for God. Wow. Been searching for God. I said, you know, I prayed this very morning. This is no coincidence. I said, uh, uh, you're a chemist and you understand that things don't just happen by chance. You understand. And he said, yeah. I said, I prayed this morning and asked the Lord, is there somebody you want me to talk to today? I said, you're that man. And uh, I won't go into all the details of the conversation. And I told him what I just told you. I send out the Bible verse. Now, he's a rough and tough non-churchgoer. But he said, yes, please send it to me. Here's my number. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to encourage you with that. It doesn't take much um, just to ask that one question after you've broken through, even with a stranger in conversation. The question is this. If there's one thing I could pray for you personally, what would it be? I've never had anyone refuse. I've done it with hundreds of people. I've done it with hundreds of people. Never had anyone refuse. It's a simple question. Mm -hmm. There's one thing I could pray for you personally. What would it be? Mm -hmm. And many people break down crying. Right. So at the beginning of this trip, the end of the trip, God has been with me. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a privilege, of course, to go back to Cameroon. 
I thank Brother Les uh, for the opportunity to share the ministry with him. Um, prior to going, Blasius, he sends me a text and he says, um, will you bring 20 or 30 kilos of medical supplies with you? <laughs> and, um, you know, it's all nonchalant on his part, but I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm really troubled, but am, am I allowed to take medicines and medical supplies, 20, 30 kilos into the country? Are they going to take me aside? Who are you? Where did you get that? And so uh, I expressed this in my return email a couple of, a couple of weeks prior to going. And he, he said this, courage, brother. Those were his words. <laughs> <laughs> courage, brother. Courage, brother. He, and he he said, you're going to be helped. You'll be fine. So I fly into Douala in Cameroon and um, waiting for my luggage, waiting for my luggage, waiting for my luggage. My luggage is lost. Oh. As it was last year. Last year, I didn't have my luggage for 12 days. <laughs> lost again so I texted Blasius from the airport he's outside I said luggage lost again just like last year and he writes back take courage brother don't lose heart <laughs> so he said I have a friend he'll help you fill out the forms so we fill out the claim report and Blasius said, it's okay. We're going to get your luggage on a bus tomorrow, and it'll be delivered to Kong Samba on Saturday. Don't lose heart. <laughs> That's fine. Saturday comes. He goes to the bus station to pick up the luggage, and he texts me and says, I've got your luggage. I've got the medical supplies. <laughs> and so, hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord. And so he gets, uh, he brings it home. I'm upstairs. He He's downstairs, comes through the front, front door. Sandy, I'm here. I've got it. And I look down and I see the bag with the medical supplies and that's fine. And then he comes upstairs with this bag. I don't look at the bag, but I, I'm hugging him. As, Thank you, brother. Oh, praise the Lord. Isn't God good? And I look down the bag. It's the wrong bag. <laughs> oh, no. It's not my luggage. It's not my luggage. <laughs> Oh, don't let your heart be troubled, he says. <laughs> I, I was troubled. That very day, God used the verse I sent out. These verses that I send out daily, they're just, I don't pull them up off of a website. They're just, they come from my own devotional reading, my own time with the Lord. That very day, the verse was this, from Genesis 17, verse 3, it said that uh, Abraham fell on his face and worshipped, and the Lord spoke to him. So immediately, I left Blasius, went to my room, Les knows it very well, it's his room now, <laughs> I fell on, and I shut the door, I fell on my face, and I said, Lord, I'm going to do what Abraham did. I am not getting up from the ground until you speak to me. What is going on here? Once again, my luggage lost. I can't believe it. I said, Lord, I'm not leaving until you speak. And I waited still before the Lord. And just like that, God said, these things that have happened to you are for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. I said, amen. I've got his word. I've got God's word. So from that point on, I got up. If my luggage never came, it didn't matter. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? When God speaks, circumstances might not change. But when God speaks, when it's a clear word from the spirit to your heart, everything else changes inside. Mm -hmm. And I could care less if I never got my luggage back because God said, this is all going to be for the furtherance of the gospel. This is an attack of the wicked one. 
He's trying to prevent you. So, hallelujah. Uh, just to let you know, the luggage did come the next day, um, Sunday afternoon. So I, I did get my, my luggage. So what happened was that seemed to be the theme for the conference. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Take courage. Be of good cheer. In, in preparing for the conference, I knew I would have five or six meetings to share in. And I thought, I've been studying the parables of Jesus, looking at some of the parables of Jesus. And I thought, I'm going to take a parable for each session that, uh, that I have. I didn't preach any of those sermons. <laughs> I realized once again that there were five people in the New Testament that Jesus said exactly those words to. Take courage. Don't lose heart. Be of good cheer. Don't let your heart be troubled. There was the, uh, the man, the paralyzed man that was um, that Jesus forgave his sin. He said, take courage. Uh, your sins are forgiven. There was a woman with the issue of blood, you remember. There was the disciples when they saw Jesus walking on the water. The disciples uh, prior to the Lord uh, going back, and uh, they, they, were, they were troubled. And then there was Paul. He was uh, about to be attacked. Remember, there, were, there was a group of people that uh, made an oath that they were, they were not going to eat again until Paul was killed. <laughs> so to each of those people, those troubled people, the Lord said, don't let your heart be troubled. Take courage. I'm with you. I'm in you. I'm standing in between you and your trouble. And it would seem that at the conference, unbeknownst to us, a lot of people were coming, were there with very troubled hearts. For various reasons, obviously. I mean, for all of us, life is hard, isn't it? Life is difficult. Um, you know that in boxing, if you're going to be a boxer, uh, you're not going to make it as a boxer if you can't take a punch. <laughs> Isn't that true? It is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, if you, you can't be a Christian. You're not going to be a Christian very long if you can't take a punch. We have to be able to take a punch, right? And um, But thankfully, the, the Lord is with us, and he gives us strength, and he brings us uh, through these situations. So it seems like there were many, many people at this conference who were troubled, troubled by life circumstances, relationships, uh, needs, um, you know, prayers not be answered, you name it, all kinds of things. And God just sovereignly um, complemented the different brothers who shared with ministry that complemented one another and was speaking to the people. Um, you've asked me to share what what did God do? It's it's very difficult to explain. How do you explain what God does in hearts by His Spirit and through His Word? Mm -hmm. um, you hear testimonies, you hear some things, but who knows what is really taking place? The deep foundational transformational work that takes place in people's hearts when. The anointed word of God is preached. Isn't the word of God powerful? Isn't the word of God yes. anointed by the spirit? It is powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And what I saw in Kong Samba at the conference is hearts that were fertile ground. Mm -hmm. Open, receptive, hungering, thirsting for the word of God, believing it was not like it says in Thessalonians, not the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God that works effectively in, uh, in, in your hearts. And so every meeting was a um, what, what was paradise. I said um, to several of the brothers, I feel like I've been dropped into a, a mm -hmm. cocoon, a paradise co cocoon or a compound. Um, I wonder... I'll test our brother. I'll put him on the spot. If he knows what the last four words 
of the last chapter, the last verse in, a, in Ezekiel is, the last four words uh, of Ezekiel 48, verse 35. Holiness to the Lord? No. The, 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 the mountain shall be holy? No. What is it? Revelations. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 48, verse 35. The last 44 words say, the Lord is there. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> so in sharing with you what took place, what I witnessed, it could be summed up in those four, the last four words of Ezekiel 4835. The Lord mm -hmm. is there. Wow. I believe it or not, I'll be 76 next month. If you just want to send me a birthday card or a gift, it's the 13th of August. I was born on Friday the 13th. I'll be 76 uh, next month. I don't feel 76. I honestly don't. I feel strong. I feel healthy. But I'm 76. And um, I'm the type of person, unlike most of you, I'm a plotter. I'm a slow learner. I'm the type of person that has to do things two, three, four times. Oh, now I get it. Okay, now I get it. So I'm at a place in my life where I feel like I understand some things and I got some things to say, some things to share that are, are, are good and valid. But I'm getting old. And so I, I was troubled by that. So on my last birthday, I said to the Lord, um, how much time do I have left, Lord? I'm, I'm, last year I was 75. And the Lord gave me two promises. And I, I'm, you'll laugh, but uh, I, I believe these are promises from God that he has given me. And I believe I've seen them begin to be worked out this year, and particularly in Cameroon. Um, the first promise the Lord gave me is that he reminded me that the last 10% of Jesus's life was the most uh, profitable. He started at 30, ended at 33. The last 10% of his life was the most fruitful. Some of you need to hear that. <laughs> the last 10% of your life. Can, who's going to believe that with me? Yes. I'm all in. Amen. I believe that. Yes. That the most fruit is going to come from my life, our lives together. No matter how many times we fail, no matter how much we think, oh, there's not been much fruit. Let's believe together that just like the Lord's life, that the last 10% can be the most fruitful. Right? Yeah. Also, in my reading, I came across this wonderful verse in Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And it says this. There's some of you standing here who will not see death until you see the kingdom of God come in power. Mm -hmm. Oh, brothers and sisters, I've wanted that more than anything. Mm -hmm. I want to see the kingdom of God come in power. Uh, in the book of Acts, where we see the presence of the Lord, the power of the Lord, the anointed preaching of the Lord, the effective working uh, of the ministry, lives absolutely transformed from the kingdom and power of darkness into the kingdom of light. Uh, I want to see that, don't you? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I, I must confess, I don't see much of it in the West, in, in uh, America, where I live, or Canada, where I'm originally from, but... I believe that was a promise given to me. Um, I retired from my church at the end of December, so I've been doing a lot of traveling uh, since that time. I was in Bolivia, uh, speaking at a conference in Bolivia, and I began to see this happen. The kingdom of God coming in. It was amazing what we saw. And um, this past uh, week in Cameroon, I witnessed this. The kingdom of God, the manifestation of the kingdom of God in absolute power. And it's wonderful. Uh, you're probably like me. You, 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 what's, the, what's the formula? What's, what's the pattern? What's the, uh, how do we do it in our situation, Lord? What, what? And I, I can't answer that question 
Uh, all I know is that in both of those places, um, those people were hungry for God. They were receptive to the preaching of the word. They made sacrifice. They, they, they prayed. They prayed. They prayed. Just crying out to, to God in desperation. In, in uh, Kong Samba, there was a, a prayer meeting at 5 o'clock in the morning. 80, 90, 100 people coming to a 5 o'clock prayer meeting to cry out to the Lord in preparation for the meeting that's going to start at 9 o'clock. That wouldn't happen in my church back home. That wouldn't happen in the churches of my city back home. But people were hungering and thirsting uh, for the Lord. And I realize that these things are in the hands of God. There, there are seasons, there are sovereign move, moves of, of God's spirit where, um, where God is there. God is everywhere, of course. But where is there? That's the question we want to, to, to ask or ask and have God answer. Uh, in, in, in your situation here locally, uh, my situation back home, what took place in Cameroon or Bolivia, God is there. Where is there? Well, there's some things that we do know that uh, God, God loves the humble heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God is there where he finds humility. Uh, God is everywhere, of course. There's nowhere we can go that God is not. But he draws near to who? The humble. And puts distance between himself and the, and the proud. So we know if God is going to be there, and we saw this in Cameroon, there's, there's going to be humility. There's going to be brokenness. There's going to be desperation. Uh, God, God loves unity. Where, where brethren dwell together in unity. God is is there, isn't he? Yes. So we want to put ourselves in a place where God can and delights to 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 meet with us, and we saw that um, in in Kong Samba. Um, what else do I want to say? I, I want to read um, something that uh, Blasius sent. Um, he, of course, he's the the local pastor there, he summarized uh, what took place in the conference. And um, I think I can do no better than just uh, read to you what, uh, what, he, what he wrote um, here. <clears throat> um, let me see. Okay. <clears throat> he says, there is a depth of joy which is ours as a result of the Lord's word preached in power. Our days began with the 5, 5 a.m. prayer meeting and lots of spectacular things happened in these meetings, which were set to begin at 5, 5, uh, 5 a.m. every morning. Um, oh, it's just, yeah, sorry. Um, The meeting was to begin at 5 a.m., but several days I went at 4.30 a.m. to prepare to lead the meeting, and I found women had been there pouring out their hearts before the Lord from 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Okay. I just I lost my... Um, yeah. He said... The whole thing was effortless and easy as we watched the Lord save lives in an open, clear, and wonderful way. Um, he goes on to say that two of Emmanuel Yemily's children were baptized. Uh, one who was at uh, 35 ran away from the Lord, angry that God had not healed the mother. And she came running to the Lord, weeping wildly. And there was a breakthrough in her spirit, and her heart was filled with joy. Her Younger uh, sibling, uh, sister saw it, and she broke down when she saw her 
sister repent and she turned to the Lord as well. Another girl who had uh, gone away from the Lord, she was in open rebellion. Um, she had a baby three months earlier with a, a wicked man. And after Sandy preached and, and poured, uh, uh, um, she poured out her heart to the Lord, praying and asking for forgiveness, uh, for breaking her parents' heart. She was baptized and her parents were, were filled with joy. Um, two other children turned to the Lord, two others uh, turned to the Lord. A blind lady was healed. I, I noticed there was this woman on the front row. She looked very, very sad at the beginning of the conference. And I would sit either beside her or two seats uh, along from her. And her continent, countenance was very, very sad and um, no response whatsoever. Uh, she was led to the meeting. I found out later she was blind. But the Lord healed this girl of blindness. Praise God. I mean, I've, I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> he healed this girl of blindness, and she was absolutely transformed. Um, uh, the Lord healed her, opened her heart, and she was walking and running and dancing, and the sisters joined her and created quite a scene at the school compound. <laughs> you can just imagine. Um, it, it was it was incredible. Um, he goes on to give other stories of um, uh, people's marriages being healed. Um, <laughs> I, I, this one uh, this one meeting. It began by another pastor from another um, uh, community coming in and sharing about parenting. And he's written a book on um, parenting, the importance of the family being in right order. And he took 15 or 20 minutes. His family did a little skit. And so there was a lot of talk about marriage and, um, and families and parenting and so on and so forth. And so this was completely spontaneous on my part. So I shared, I said, um, tomorrow is my 56th wedding anniversary. <laughs> yeah. And so I said, I want to give you the single secret as to why our marriage has been blessed of the Lord, uh, why we have such happiness, why there's been uh, some fruit from our lives. And it's because we were... We wholly and totally sold out to the Lord, Amen. you know, and uh, right from the start, you know, and made uh, glad sacrifices where Jesus was going to be everything. We're all in no matter what the cost. And um, so this, again, was very spontaneous. And I, I said, um, I, I'm going to share with you men some things that I learned. I said, men, there are. There are three things that you need to say to be able to, to learn to say to your wife. I said, um, the three things each have three words. And I said, um, some of you have never said these words to your, to your wives. So I'm going to teach you. I said, all the married men stand up. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So uh, they all stood up. And I said, Here, here's the first one. I want you to repeat these three words after me. I was wrong. <laughs> I said, I know it's difficult. You've never heard those words before, but you men, repeat it after me. I was wrong. And so they said it, okay? So then I said this. Now go say it to your wife. <laughs> And the place erupted, absolutely erupted, as these men went to their wives and said those three words. So I brought them back. I said, here are the next three words. I am sorry. <laughs> now go tell your wife. And they each went to their own wives and, uh, um, and said those words. And... Um, they came back. These are the three the third words. Please forgive me. 
So they went and asked the wives for forgiveness. It was it was actually it was actually a very solemn holy uh, holy time because these guys realized that <laughs> I've never done this before, and the wives were, were were just thrilled because I'd said to the wives, uh, "You find Jesus irresistible, don't you?" And um, Jesus in your husband would be irresistible. And I said, I'm going to help these guys become more like Jesus. So uh, that was great. So then I, I had the women stand up and I said, there, there are only three words that, that you need to say. Um, you're not as thick as the men. So uh, here are your three words. I love you. And they said those three. I said, now go tell your husband. Wow. It was amazing. <laughs> It was it was amazing, and it was very lighthearted, as you can appreciate. The, the The whole place was just filled with joy and laughter and tears. You can imagine what was going on, and it it was really absolutely wonderful. And um, God, in that moment, was was really repairing some marriages. When a man came up to me afterwards and said. I prayed before this meeting that God would restore my marriage. This is an exact quote. He said, I have been wicked towards my wife. Wow. I've been wicked. And he said, God has done. And he was full of joy. Of course, his wife was, was thrilled. Mm -hmm. And there are these kinds of testimonies mm -hmm. that were happening um, just because of the... The leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, each meeting, each meeting was different. Each meeting, God was there. There was spontaneity. As I said, the things that I thought I, I was going to share, I didn't share. And um, I shared some personal things. Uh, one thing that really impacted um, many people Perhaps it needs to be shared with you. Perhaps someone needs to um, uh, to hear this because one of the brothers uh, touched on the life of Joseph uh, in one of the meetings. And the providence of God that um, um, no matter what happens, God is going to win. Mm -hmm. One of the meetings I told him uh, of a man I know who, who plays chess, and he's an excellent chess player. And he went on holiday to this, uh, to this uh, resort, and he was sitting in the main uh, seating area of the resort, a common area, and there was a chess board on the table, and there was an elderly gentleman sitting uh, on the couch beside the chess board. And he went to the man, he said, uh, do, do you play chess by any chance? And he said, yeah, I do, I, pl I play a little. He said, would you like to have a game? And he said, yeah, sure. And so the man I'm talking about, who was this excellent chess player, um, this is what he said. Within four moves, I realized I was up against a chess master. <laughs> and I realized that it didn't matter what I did, where I moved, I was going to lose. <laughs> I was not going to win this match. And isn't that true of God? Yes. That God sovereignly even uses evil, evil men, evil intent. He certainly did it in the life of the Lord. But God, it was God's by, by God's determined counsel that these things should happen. And in the life of Joseph, right? Mm, yeah. Especially in the life of Joseph. But God was with Joseph. And so I shared uh, with them that Joseph and I, we became mates mm -hmm. many years ago. We became the best of friends. Why? Because of a crisis that I was going through, my wife and I were going through with our daughter. She grew up, she was the perfect daughter, perfect child. I mean, absolutely perfect. We never had to discipline her. She always did her homework. She um, she did well in school. 
Uh, she was obedient. Uh, she uh, took a stand for the Lord in high school against all the other uh, students who wanted to do things she knew was not appropriate. Uh, she went to Bible college. Uh, she married young at 19, and uh, she attended Bible college with her husband. And um, after five years, she was living in the same city as my wife and I. After five years, she came to us and said, I don't love Derek anymore, and I'm going to divorce him. Wow. I like him, but I don't love him, and I don't want to be married to him anymore. We thought, what's happened to our daughter? <laughs> and of course, it, it broke our hearts. We think, what in the world has taken place? What has caused this? She would not listen to us. She would not take counseling. She was just bound, bent, determined. We'd never seen this side uh, of her. Uh, her younger sister said, oh, she's just having her teenage rebellion crisis uh, uh, in her 20s, in her mid-20s. And it broke our hearts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely broke our hearts. And so I spent the next 18 months with Joseph, <laughs> mm -hmm. getting to know Joseph. Wonderful promise from the Lord that this is what's going to happen. Uh, your brothers and your sisters, your mother, your father, they're going to all bow down for you. You're going to be elevated. You're going to be exalted. I think, hallelujah, I can take that. What a, what a vision. What a promise that is. But nowhere in the vision did God say there's going to be pits. There's going to be prison. There's going to be pain. There's going to be all kinds of delay, heartache. But he never doubted. God was with Joseph. And through each crisis that he went through, he's getting closer and closer and closer to the fulfillment of the promise. And we know how the story all ended up. But the pain is real. The pain that you're going through is real. Mm -hmm. The crisis is real, particularly relationally, as it was with my wife and I and our daughter. And you're, you're like Jehoshaphat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We have no power to fix this, and we don't know what to do. But Lord, our eyes are on you. Amen. Our eyes are on you. So there's nothing we could do. And um, she began living with this man for four years. And I mean, she still loved us, but she was just turned her back on the Lord and um, living with this man, but it eventually stops. We thought, hallelujah, our prayers have been answered. And then she comes to us in, in January of 1998 and says, uh, I'm pregnant through another man. Hmm. Out partying New Year's Eve, got pregnant. I think, wow. And our granddaughter was born nine months later. Yeah, fortunately that relationship, she severed and never uh, never pursued it. And in the meantime, she turned back to the Lord. Now as a single mother, um, she humbled herself before the Lord. She was broken, repented, took her full responsibility, and um, she moved to Florida with us with her 18-month-old daughter. And... In Florida, um, she lived with us, and a few, a few years later, she met a man in the church, and um, she married him. It was a big mistake. Two weeks before the marriage, she's telling us after, two weeks, she knew she made a mistake. She knew she should pull out. She knew it was wrong. He wasn't the right person for her, but she felt she was in too far. Arrangements had been made, and she married this man and had twin boys who are now 18 years of age. And that marriage didn't last. And then 11 years ago, she married another man who she's currently with. He's a godly man, and they have a wonderful marriage now. But she'd been married three times. Yeah. yeah. However, despite the history, Despite the background, uh, 
And even the condemnation that we feel, we felt, my wife and I, what, what, did, what did we do wrong? Uh, did, you know, were we too involved in, in ministry that, we, uh, that she went this way? Uh, is it our fault? And of course, we've got an enemy, don't we? He, he doesn't whisper in your ear. He shouts in your ear. Uh, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. And you cry out to God, but we, we give him thanks and praise that he restored uh, my daughter. He's, he, he's redeemed her, and she's one of the godliest women that you will ever meet. Les and Vicky uh, know her, and we are so proud of her. She's got a wonderful ministry in my city uh, to, to single moms and also in Jamaica. Um, amazing story. Um, she is just sold out with her husband for the Lord, and it's, um, it's, it's a great redemption story. Um, so don't give up hope. Your spouse, your child, wayward child. Um, back in my Bible, I've got a list of 50 names here. It's called my PPP list, and it's called Praying for Parents with Prodigals. <laughs> Praying for Parents with Prodigals. And uh, I've got 50 names. Number one, first one on the list, on the list, Les and Vicki Wielden. <laughs> and many very close friends in, in ministry um, who are brokenhearted over their children who are wayward, who, who, are, who are prodigal. And, um, and so I'm standing, interceding for these parents, praying for these prodigal children that not, not one of them will, will be lost, that each and every one of them will be found. And I want to give you a promise that I have as I pray for them. It's in uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 16 and 17, if I can just take a moment. Um, I say these things because they were really helpful to those who were troubled at the conference in Kongsamba. We found out afterwards that many, many, many uh, parents were there brokenhearted, but there were many prodigals there in the conference who realized that they had wounded the parents and were turning their hearts back. Listen to this verse. Maybe this is a word for someone here in the room or someone watching tonight. It says, thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Isn't that a wonderful promise? And I just pray that uh, for these for these parents with prodigals, and I pray it for um, the prodigals themselves, and just believing that the Lord's going to bring them um, all back. Um, so that was a that was powerful. Some of the things I personal things that that I, I shared, um, and a lot more could be said. Um, it's almost nine o'clock. I just wanted to throw it out to you. Do you have any questions that you want to ask me um, regarding the, the conference particularly? I, 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 I wish you could have been there. It's one of those things that uh, you, you, you had to be there to experience just, the, it, it, was, it was just God in the midst. It was just an outpouring of a spirit uh, overflowed with joy. Uh, the, the mark was that these people, um, they loved Jesus. They loved Jesus extravagantly, and they, they loved one another, and they loved me. I felt like a rock star. <laughs> I felt like a rock star. I mean, the young, ki the young children coming up and wanting to be hugged and hugging me, and it was, it's all God. As, like I said earlier, I'm just a turtle on a post. I'm just a, a, a yielded vessel. It's, it's Jesus himself. It's the Lord gets all the glory and the praise. And we want to say uh, 
God do it and in our environment. I, I do I don't want to miss this. I want to I want to read one other thing uh, to you. Um, because you don't live in Kong Samba. Um, I hope I can find this. You live here in London. I got this from a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, just a couple of days ago. This is what he says. It's hard to put into words what has happened over these last days in London. Are you listening? My friend from America, my pastor friend, it's hard to put in words what has happened these last days in London. Around 400 took part in three days of training and impact across central London, including precious times of worship and prayer. Now listen to this. Last night exceeded all expectations with 6,000 six young people gathered in Wembley with such an incredible hunger for God. I have never seen this in the UK, and I am overwhelmed with what God is doing. This is the time, the time God has chosen to move and to call many to know him and to join him on mission to reach this generation for Jesus. And there's a picture here. You can, uh, you can, I'll show it to you later. You can come and see it of this crowd of young people at, at this meeting. Isn't that amazing? amazing. Here in your city, just in these last few days. Yes. Praise God. So, uh, Amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandy. I think we'll better stop the recording, but um, you got a message this morning from Fee Harvey. Do you want to share that? Yeah. It's uh, similar down in. It's still online, isn't it? I don't know. Would you stop the recording?